you gave me this great expression yesterday. You said it in Hebrew. Um, stolen water, sweeter taste. It's stolen waters are sweet. Mayim genuvim yimtaku. Stolen mean? waters are sweet. Why? What does that? What does that mean when it comes to the internet? When um, it's not just with the internet. It comes with anything. The more you try to deny something, the more you create a desire for it. So by building the wall higher and higher and higher to try to keep people out, the more you create that desire to peek over the wall and see what's on the other side. So then again, that doesn't mean that we should just unlock the gate and let the waters flow, but there has to be a moderation and there has to be, you know, a certain amount of understanding of of what there is over there, but that it can be dangerous. One of the examples I always use is crossing the street. Uh, for anybody who lives in the five boroughs certainly understands this. When you have a newborn baby, you carry it across the street. At two, you hold their hand and you walk across the street with them. At four, you maybe walk across the street, but you don't hold their hand. At six, you stand on the curb and watch them cross. At eight, you watch from the window, and at 10, they've got enough responsibility, maturity, and understanding that that bus might hurt them, and they know how to cross by themselves. And then you trust them because they've shown their maturity and understanding. Um, we're not doing that with the internet and with technology. And this is not a Jewish problem. This is not anybody's problem. This is a problem that's universal in the world. I sort of make a joke about it. It doesn't matter whether you're an Orthodox Jew, a Reformed Jew, or even a Catholic Jew, the problem is there, and it affects every element of our society. Um, the issues with inappropriate use of technology don't care what you look like. Nonetheless, by virtue of who you are, <clears throat> where you live, and what your background is, most of your clients, the overwhelming cl uh, majority of your clients are Jewish. Tell us what you find. I find, Who are your clients? I can tell you my clients are, for the most part, 99% of them are Orthodox Jews from every walk in persuasion. Granted, I have a number of, of clientele who are not Jewish at all uh, or even, you know, uh, maybe culturally Jewish, but, but certainly not um, uh, Orthodox. Of my Orthodox clientele, I have people who are completely addicted to online pornography. I have people who are addicted to um, too much gaming. Their entire lives are gaming. They've, they've lost their jobs or they've ruined their families because they can't step away from um, um, uh, Second Life or uh, um, any of the other um, um, multiplayer gaming uh, programs. Um, I have people who have fallen so hard that they have then gone from the cyber world of issues into the physical world of cheating spouses that can be uh, and is not just husbands but I have wives I have young people who are in the midst of uh, relationships which communally would be shocking to their friends relatives and neighbors if they knew about it and um, what I'm finding is that there's a big gaping hole in our education, in the Orthodox Jewish educational system, that is not addressing these issues. Now, in my humble opinion, um, our leadership has lost control. And what they're trying to do, and this is something I think that they tried to do with this uh, recent um, um, get-together in City Field, was to try to regain control of the community. But the fact of the matter is, is that the barn door is or open and the horse has bolted. And regaining that control may not even be possible. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. So what are you saying, that the entire... Uh, hierarchy of, of Orthodox Judaism has been compromised by the internet? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that that the leadership itself isn't educated enough about it in order to be able to put down any concrete 
policies and procedures of how it should be handled. So when in doubt, just you know, lock down, and that doesn't work. There was a, a just a week before the um, get together in City Field. There was a picture in one of the Jewish newspapers, and it was taken from down at City Field, down at the, the field level, looking up the um, seats up onto the first tier, and there was a group of guys there. Uh, and underneath in the caption it said um, uh, various people preparing for the uh, upcoming event. And it was a nice picture of six people standing there. Because of my background and uh, the way I noticed things, I looked closely at the picture. Four of the six people were either texting or on cell phones in the picture. And yet the whole purpose of this event was to get rid of it, basically. Okay, only under certain circumstances should you have any of these uh, technological devices. Now, the fact of the matter is that what has really been created is a double standard. Nobody's going to give this up. And I say nobody. Certainly there are people who just agree that, you know, their rabbi told them that they have to do something and therefore they have blind faith and they do it. But that's the exception to the rule. Last year I was in Australia. As I met the people there, they all bragged to me about the fact that nobody here has internet in their houses. And I said, well, that's wonderful. And as I'm talking to the people, they'd pull out their iPhone or their Blackberry or whatever device they were having. And I would say, let me ask you a question. I said, do you, do you take that phone home with you? He says, yeah. I said, well, then you're lying. You do have internet. No, this doesn't count. So. To me, it's an absolute double standard that has been created. Then, of course, there were um, various um, places where the um, leadership said, um, you can have it, but only if it's for business. So, of course, everybody needs it for business, <laughs> right? Now, the biggest um, denial is when parents say to me, my kids know nothing about any of this stuff. They don't use this technology. They don't have cell phones. They don't have texting, anything. Well, unfortunately, that's not true because everybody knows that anybody can walk into any bodega or a Target or Pathmark or any store and walk in and buy a throwaway phone for $10, $9.98 at Walmart, it comes with 30 minutes of talk time, email, texting, internet if you want, and when you're done with it, you throw it in the garbage. And kids buy these because one hour of babysitting pays for it. So, um, and I've had, uh, I've had 13 year olds who came in to me, that their parents brought to me when they found out that their 13-year-old child in an orthodox environment was addicted to pornography. And I'm out on the cutting edge because I'm the one guy that's willing to acknowledge the 800-pound the gorilla in the room. And no one else wants to do that. Well, what, it, what is the, what, what should they have done at the ASIFA? I mean, what did they do that, that you wouldn't recommend? This get-together at City Field was wonderful if all it wanted to do was to bring 40,000 Jewish men together and have a day of prayer and solidarity. There, as far as that's concerned, it was an over-the-top success. Amazing, wonderful thing, beautiful. But that's all it was, because there was no end game from it. There was no solid, accepted, definitive answer as to what we should be doing about this because unfortunately no matter what any one person says no one's going to listen to it well isn't it to you know use the internet only for godly things i don't really know as you know i've been out on the i've been out on the lecture circuit for 13 years now preaching about awareness and safety using technology one of the things I recommend to people is to put a filter on their computer. And granted, they did that at this uh, get-together. But along with me telling people they need a filter, I always tell people, listen, 
If you want to be good and you don't want to go to pornography sites or inappropriate sites or whatever it might be, then a filter will help you because it'll keep you from accidentally going there. But if you want to go there, there's nothing that can stop you from going to those places because I've got a burglar alarm on my house. If they want to get in here badly enough, it doesn't matter if I have 10 alarms, they're going to get by them. So what, what I have been trying to preach and what I am pushing very hard for is to create a curriculum. It's a product, it's, a, it's a, uh, um, uh, an initiative that I'm working on right now that will create a curriculum that can be taught in schools from kindergarten through 12th grade as each year appropriate that teaches how to cross the street as far as technology is concerned. You know, um, take any 13-year-old and they will choke you in order to get an iPod if they don't already have one by now. And by the time they're 16, they want an iPhone with all the bells and whistles because everybody else has it. You're ruining my life because all my friends have it and you won't get it for me, right? Well, I want to change that. Now, the truth of the matter is, is that for this generation, certainly for my generation, but even the younger generation, my kids, it's too late. I can't go and turn that off because they've all been spoiled. You see, back in 1957 when the Internet started, thank you, Mr. Gore, um, no one sat down and said, okay, here's what this thing is and here's how it's going to affect the way we think and the way we operate our minds and the way we do things and the way we buy and the way we live our lives. Nobody ever stopped and said, what effect is that going to have on us positively or negatively? As a matter of fact, Steve Jobs died this past year, okay, and they've all but sainted him. I, my prediction is that in the next five years or so, from going from sainting him, the tide will turn and he will be demonized because people are going to start to realize how intrusive technology has become on our lives. And um, as a matter of fact, I just read an article today about uh, one of the senior vice presidents of Google that every Saturday, I don't think it's because of the Sabbath, but every Saturday she turns her phone and her computer and all her technology off and she meditates and she gets back to herself. Now, I've, of course, been preaching that same thing for all these years, saying, you know, don't call the Sabbath Shabbat. Call it, I'm a cell phone, and if I try to use myself more than six days, my batteries run dry. I need one day to recharge my batteries. Call it a, 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 a cultural Sabbath. Call it whatever you want. But we need a day to, to walk away from all this stuff and sort of uh, detox. Do you think that the rabbis, I mean, the rabbis who spoke, all of them were men, obviously, and all of them were, not all of them, but what I could see, they were all getting up in age. It's not like they themselves are surfing the web too much. Um, is that reflective of their, I guess, their myopia? I'm going to put myself possibly in some danger here by saying that unfortunately with many rabbis, I can't say all because I don't know all of them, but with many rabbis they let their egos get in their way. And uh, my particular rabbi, if I go to ask him advice on something, no matter what it is, he always seems to say to me, let me get back to you on that. And finally after a number of times I asked him, I said, why do you do that to me all the time? Sometimes I could call you and ask you you know, do I really have to keep kosher? Like, that should be a no-brainer. Why do you tell me I have to get back to you? And he gave me a very good answer. He said, um, first of all, I don't give you an instant answer because I don't want you to feel stupid. Like, oh, I should have known that. And number two, he says, I know you think I know everything. And sometimes I'd like to think I know everything. But the fact of the matter is, is I don't. He says, so when I get a question about something I'm not sure of, I go to my Rolodex, he still has a Rolodex, not, a, uh, not some electronic thing, and I look up an expert on that subject. 
I call them, I discuss it with them, I educate myself, and then I come back to you and say, okay, here's what I think you should do. So, and he complimented me, told me that I'm actually one of his experts in his Rolodex, so that was nice to hear. But that's what our leadership needs to be doing, and unfortunately, that's not always the case. Well, how, how has that played out in the ASIFA? So what that is, is that the ASIFA became a political uh, um, maneuvering by various rabbis who kind of were trying to elbow their way to the front of the pile. And um, we'll, you know, we'll be there, but only if we get to speak. And I'm not going to speak if I speak after him or before him. Or, you know, it, 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 it's, it lost its... It, 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 got, it got lost in the maze. Well, uh, the, I mean, what was the, what's the takeaway message from it? Well, that was the subtle thing going on behind the scenes. The takeaway message was supposed to be a day of prayer, a day of uh, awareness, and a day of answers as to how we should deal with this uncharted territory called technology. But it wasn't that. Well, you, can, you, you can't really blame them for trying, I guess, because they, they, are, they come up with all these concerns of, I mean, they're trying to blame, I guess, all of society's I health. have to be careful of how I say what I'm about to say, because I don't want anyone to think that, that first of all, no one owes me anything. Certainly, second of all, um, who am I? But the fact of the matter is, is I am a known name out there in certainly the Jewish world on this topic. I've been leading the charge. Yeah, that's why I'm here. I didn't get one phone call from anybody asking me to come there and, and, and be available to speak or even just to be available for people to ask questions to. Not one. The rabbis are um, probably perplexed by this new thing, which is uh, undermining their power. Is that, is that accurate to say? Sure. So, so here I am. <laughs> Ready, willing, and able. Oh, I'll sit down and... I, I, I uh, quote somebody that once said something to me, I will push a penny to Albany with my nose if that's what it takes to get people to listen to my message. And I know that I'm on message. I know that I've, I've got it. I know that I'm there because of, number one, the people I've been helping in my own private practice, as well as the people who call me and email me and say, I heard your presentation, I saw what you said, you are on the money. Please keep up your work. Please do something to help us because we're in quicksand and we're sinking. So what, what do you say to those, um, you know, give me two pieces of advice, someone coming to you who finds himself sucked into the vortex of the internet and doesn't feel particular. Well, first and foremost, people have to understand that the addictive nature of the internet and technology, whether it's a cell phone or the internet itself, or a computer, or an iPad, or any of these devices, potentially that is more addictive than drugs or alcohol. Now, any third grader knows that drugs and alcohol are dangerous, because we all understand that it's a chemical, you put it in your body, and it has a chemical change effect on your brain. So we say, well, what's the big deal with a computer? I'm sitting at the keyboard, tick, 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 big deal. Well, what, we, what people don't understand is that, that that effect is actually causing chemical changes in your brain in, in the name of endorphins and other, uh, and other chemicals. So what happens is, is that, uh, the, for instance, you go on to eBay. Have you ever won anything on eBay? nobody's ever won anything they earned the right to buy something okay because they outbid somebody else but um if you ever have bought anything on ebay when you got it you had that sort of elated feeling so you buy this thing on ebay you get that elated feeling because those endorphins are releasing into your blood so your brain says hey that's a good feeling i want more of that or you get into a chat with somebody and you have a little bit of a racy conversation hey that's exciting that feels good especially if you're a uh, uh, a hormonal teenager or adult, it doesn't matter, I guess. And it's, so it's, it's actually, from, a, from an addiction and chemical perspective, it's exactly the same thing that goes on when someone's in a casino putting money into a slot machine. 
it has the exact same effect. One more quarter, one more pull of the handle, or these days one push of the button. I'm going to hit the big jackpot. One more time, I'm going to get it. I'm going to have that great chat, or I'm going to find that great article, or I'm going to meet that great person, the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one. And it causes you to literally tune out your whole time and space uh, uh, awareness. And, and you focus in on that screen, and, and everything just shuts down otherwise. So there was a movement even before the ASIFA to ban the Internet entirely. Is that, is that I was called about that. And I, and I said to the people who called me, please, please, whatever you do, don't embarrass yourselves. Nobody's going to listen to you. You can't expect people, this is not Jonestown, you can't expect people to line up and drink the Kool-Aid. It just doesn't go that way. We're not that kind of a society. However, there are people within the leadership roles that do think that that's what their job is, is to lead us blindly down the path. Who were the people who tried to ban it? Where were they from? It was some of the leadership in the more, in the more right-wing sure. part of the community. I mean here, Brooklyn? Uh, Lakewood. Oh, it was the Lakewood, yeah. yeah. Where the internet is banned at, uh, at the... Which it's not. And it's banned, yes, but it's, it's there. Yeah. It's there. It's it's you know it's it's under lock and key in every house or a lot of the houses, but it's there. Interesting. Okay. Um, I think I have anything else to ask you. Right. So at that point, so people from Lakewood gave you a ring. Said. Right. And I've met with Rabbi Solomon, who was the one who put together the Asifa. The Matis Yahu Solomon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've met with him numerous times. He knows who I am. I I mean, you'd ask him. You know, Phil. Yes. Um, he's struggling with this because I understand why he thinks that it m maybe should be banned, but it's not. This is the 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 magic genie's out of the bottle. You know, in in the United Kingdom, as of 2014, you won't be able to write a check anymore. There's a law on the books. The banks are going to change the way they do business. The the analog way of life is on its way out, if not already gone. Two, you hold their hand and you walk across the street with them. At four, you maybe walk across the street, but you don't hold their hand. At six, you stand on the curb and watch them cross. At eight, you watch from the window. And at 10, they've got enough responsibility, maturity, and understanding that that bus might hurt them and they know how to cross by themselves. And then you trust them because they've shown their maturity and understanding. Um, we're not doing that with the internet and with technology. And this is not a Jewish... Most of your clients, the overwhelming cl uh, majority of your clients are Jewish. Tell us what you find. I find... Who, who are your clients? I can tell you my clients are, for the most part, 99% of them are Orthodox Jews from every walk in persuasion. Granted, I have a number of, of clientele who are not Jewish at all, uh, or even, you know, uh, maybe culturally Jewish, but, but certainly not um, uh, Orthodox. Of my Orthodox clientele problem, this is not anybody's problem. This is a problem that's universal in the world. I sort of make a joke about it. It doesn't matter whether you're an Orthodox Jew, a Reformed Jew, or even a Catholic Jew. The problem is there and it affects every element of our society. Um, the issues with inappropriate use of technology don't care what you look like. Nonetheless, by virtue of who you are, <clears throat> where you live, and what your background is. Peek over the wall and see what's on the other side. So then again, that doesn't mean that we should just unlock the gate and let the waters flow, but there has to be a moderation and there has to be, you know, a certain amount of understanding of of what there is over there, but that it can be dangerous. One of the examples I always use is crossing the street. Uh, for anybody who lives in the five boroughs, certainly understands this. When you have a newborn baby, you carry it across the street. At two, you gave me this great expression yesterday. You said it in Hebrew: um, "Stolen water, sweeter taste." It's stolen waters are sweet. Mayim genuvim yimtaku. Stolen waters are sweet. 
Why? What does that What does that mean when it comes to the internet? When um, it's not just with the internet; it comes with anything. The more you try to deny something, the more you create a desire for it. So by building the wall higher and higher and higher to try to keep people out, the more you create that desire to.